I want to thank you for organizing this uh, exciting you know, workshop during the summer and allow my participation. And today my talk is Molecular Engineering and FLAT for Visualizing Intracellular Signal Transduction. I will also you know, utilize a couple uh, examples to show how we can visualize mechanical transduction as well. So it's our vision that a cell is very like a city. The organelles are like buildings and the molecules trafficking between the organelles like people running between buildings. So how can we visualize these molecules in a living cell? If you look at microscope, probably you don't see much if you don't use you know, other techniques. Then how can we visualize different molecules? If you can imagine that's what's happening inside the cell, how can we visualize different molecules with different colors? For this purpose, I want to introduce GFP and jellyfish. I guess many of you probably already know GFP, right? But how many of you know GFP is discovered from jellyfish originally? Raise your hand. Quite good, almost everybody. Very nice. So GFP was discovered mainly at the tip of the jellyfish. <laughs> Actually, the story is quite interesting. GFP was not the, you know, the target to be discovered at this region because in the mechanism of the fluorescence emitted by jellyfish, you know, if you perturb a jellyfish, it will emit green light. But the sensor molecule is not GFP, actually is so-called acrine. So whenever a jellyfish is perturbed, the channel, calcium channel will be opened and the calcium will get into the cell. And this calcium will bind to acrine, not GFP. And acrine will start to emit blue light, which will transfer to excite the GFP. Then you see the green light. So GFP actually was at that time regarded as like a byproduct. Okay, people are more interested in studying acrine. And uh, not many people really care or appreciate the importance of GFP, except Osamu, who is just you know based on his pure scientific curiosity. He really want to purify the GFP, and he did a lot of work and publish and characterize the GFP properties in this journal called Journal of Cellular and Comparative Physiology. But this journal has been changed the name. Now it's called Journal of Cellular Physiology. And as you can see, he's holding a bottle with a lot of GFP protein purified. You can imagine probably you know hundred thousand jellyfish has to be sacrificed in this bottle, right? But at that time, nobody really knows or cares you know, how to utilize them. So after several decades, another person, Douglas Pressure, who came up with the revolution idea, he thought, if we can know the gene sequence encoding GFP, then we can easily insert the sequence of gene encoding GFP together with a targeting molecule gene sequence. Okay, Then you will create a uh, chimeric protein with the targeting molecule and also attached to a GFP. So therefore, wherever the target molecule goes, you can see the color. So you know the dynamics of this target molecule. This is a really revolutionary thought. But at that time, the sequencing technique is very low, you know, level, and it's very difficult to get the sequence of GFP. So he really invests all his effort to try to sequence GFP. And it took a long time when his tenure clock is up, actually at that time he was an uh, assistant professor in Wuzho. And when the time is up, he has not finished and completed the gene sequence yet. So his tenure was turned down and he dropped off from academic. And when the Nobel Prize was announced, he was a taxi driver and he was not one of the laureate. However, his contribution, his seminal contribution actually is very well recognized by the field. So actually the two Nobel laureates Roger Chen and Mahdi Chauvi sponsored him and his wife to go attend the Nobel you know, ceremony. So he's really laid the foundation for the GOP revolution. And the uh, uh, third person I'll introduce about the GOP revolution is Mahdi Chauvi. So he basically called Douglas pressure because at that time Douglas cannot continue to carry on the research, so he called, got the gene sequence, and introduced into bacteria. Because at that time, people were debating whether GLP would work outside of jellyfish. People were thinking maybe jellyfish provide an environment 
or cofactors for GFP to be functional. If you take it out, it would never work. So he did a very simple experiment, and this is a major result published in Science. As you can see on the left is the you know, native bacteria, and on the right side is the bacteria expressing the GFP gene. You can see GFP gene alone can produce a protein and produce the fluorescence. Okay? So this experiment provides very important evidence to show that GFP alone can work by itself. Okay? So this was published in 1994. As you can imagine, whenever you look at the green color, people will start to think whether a red color fluorescent protein would be a variable, right? So this I want to introduce the fourth person, Sergei Lukyanov. He is the one really discovered the red frozen protein called DSRAD, derived from Discosoma, which is a coral reef from Indo-Pacific. As you can see on the central image, this is the GFP protein purified. On the left side is the DSRAD. So the color is quite different. If you introduce DSRAD into cell, you can nicely see the red color from the cell. But this DSRAD has some problem because it will artificially aggregate. So four copy of DSRAD will stick together. So this may cause some problem, right? Because if you introduce the DSRAD gene into a target molecule, four copy of the target molecule will be artificially aggregated, which may perturb the function of the target molecule, right? So then Roger Chen is the one really figure out all the biochemistry of the fluorescent protein. He figure out the chemistry, how this chromophore is formed. You know, they have to be oxidized, saccharized to produce chromophore inside this beta baryl can. And because of this understanding, he can make mutations next to the chromophore amino acids. Therefore, he can produce different color of the fluorescent proteins. And also, these fluorescent proteins are monomer, meaning they will not artificially ag aggregate together. Okay? So this lower left corner is a uh, you know, bacteria plate. His lab member introduced bacteria expressing different color of the frozen proteins and create this, you know, Christmas gift for him. So with this green frozen protein and uh, its colorful derivatives, now it's very convenient. As you can imagine, you can easily do some subcloning to put target molecule gene together with GLP gene so that you can create, you know, a uh, chimeric protein. Wherever the target molecule goes, the GLP will go together. So you can shine and light up the traffic or the target molecule. So I just want to show a movie, as you can already see from other speakers. You know, without GLP, it will be very difficult for you to see the dynamic of these uh, subtoskeletal uh, uh, microtubule filaments. With the different color frozen proteins, of course, you can also visualize simultaneously, simultaneously multiple cytoskeleton components, such as in this uh, neuronal cell. Uh, this movie somehow cannot be played, but I just want to describe. This is a growth cone, okay, a neuronal cell extending the growth cone. And uh, on the lower left corner are the acting filaments. On the upper right side is microtubules. So if you superimpose Together, you can clearly see the relative, you know, positions and dynamics of different subtoskeletal components. As you can see, acting filaments in the front and microtubule following the acting filaments. So all these become possible, but there are more cool things you can do. One is called photoactivatable and photoswitchable fluorescent proteins. So because the understanding of these fluorescent proteins, we can make mutations. And, for example, you can make mutations so that the frozen protein will become non fluorescent okay? But upon a shining of UV light, it will recover the green frozen protein, photoactivatable, okay? Or the frozen protein initially will become green, but upon the UV light shining, it will become red. Even better, people can also engineer so-called Jungpa frozen protein, which has no color in the beginning. Upon UV shining, it will have green color. But if you shine with blue color, then the frozen protein will be converted back to non-color. Okay? So this will be very useful tools if you can introduce into the cell, you can specifically light up a small population of the frozen protein at subcellular regions and monitor how the target molecule is transported across the whole cell body. 
people can also engineer the frozen protein by you know cut in the middle of the GMP gene, for example, 144, 145 sites, and swap the two gene sequence together. In general, most of protein will not survive, right? After you swap the gene sequence, it will just that will become dead. But these so-called circularly permuted frozen protein, they still frozen, although you you know completely swap the two segments of a gene sequence. But it has some unique feature. It will become more sensitive sensitive to the environment, so people can easily insert some sensitive domain or molecular domains, for example, connecting the original N terminal, C terminal, so that whenever this domain intact with a stimulator in the cell, it will change the frozen color of these circularly permuted frozen proteins. Or you can insert two intacting domains at the new N terminal, C terminal. Whenever stimula stimulation comes, it will change the frozen color. So therefore, you can utilize this single frozen protein to monitor the environmental change or biochemical signals. I want to introduce one example how people can utilize circularly permitted the frozen protein to measure intracellular biochemical signals. So this is one example. People can create a circularly permitted enhanced green frozen protein and then attach the two terminals with a calmodulin molecule and M13. And it's known that calmodulin can bind to calcium. Whenever calcium binds to calmodulin, it will start to intact with M13. So this interaction would cause the pro frozen property change of the CPEGFP, okay? And therefore color will change, and you know calcium is bonding, right? So people have utilized this power sensor to visualize the calcium concentration in uh, embryonic chicken heart. This is a movie on the show. Red color represents high calcium concentration. Blue color represents low calcium concentration. As you can see nicely, you can visualize the dynamics of calcium oscillation in this embryonic chicken heart. There are also other technologies utilizing frozen proteins, such as frozen's lifetime microscope, which can measure the lifetime of frozen protein, and therefore know and measure the biochemical environment neighboring to the frozen protein. Another one is called the chromophore assisted laser inactivation, so called Cali. As we already know, oops, sorry, maybe something's, something's going on. Let me start again. Sorry about that. Maybe it's automatically shutting down because of the. Let's see whether it's still. Sorry, maybe we have to wait a couple minutes, then I need, I need to restart the computer. <laughs> I don't know why, it didn't tell me. <laughs> There's no warning at all, and obviously everything is shutting down. You, you plugged in your power? Uh, I think it's not because of power. Yeah, something must be going on. Maybe too exciting about, you know, <laughs> the frozen protein revolution, right? <laughs> but truly, the calorie technology is very exciting because you know, probably you already know SINA, right? How many people know SINA? Okay, so whichever you want to target or inhibit the specific molecule, you can introduce SINA into the cell, right? And knock down this molecule. But SINA cannot specifically knock down molecules at subcellular regions. If you deliver SINA, the whole protein will be gone in the whole cell, right? But the carrier can specifically knock down local mo molecules, okay? So basically the idea is, because we know the frozen protein biochemistry, you can mutate the frozen protein so that it will generate a lot of reactive oxidative stress whenever it's excited. So this reactive oxidative stress can destroy certain molecules if you attach the molecule to the frozen protein. So you can imagine if you excite the frozen protein, the neighboring molecule will be destroyed locally, yeah. right? Because you can excite at subcellular regions. You don't need to excite the whole cell. Right? So it will give you the advantage to specifically destroy the subcellular region of the frozen protein and therefore the target molecule. Is it clear to you? The advantage comparing to SIA is it has specificity in terms of targeting the subcellular region of the frozen or targeting molecules. Hopefully it will restart. 
see me dash. Yeah, it's annoying, you know, these new version of the Windows, they will just automatically, you know, restart for you without asking permission, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe MIT should do more work to help Microsoft, right, <laughs> to improve. At least at, at one layer of control for the system. So how, how flexible is this method, Peter, in terms of, can, is, it, is it available for, for, can you design it for any protein that you want to either activate or deactivate? Uh, I think it's uh, depend on what kind of protein, you know. For example, for phosphatase, it's quite easy because reactive oxi oxidative stress would, you know, oxidize the sulfate group on the phosphatase, which is very important for the phosphate, phosphate functions. But for other molecules, really have to do a lot of work to change the linkers, the lens, the distance to have effective shutdown of the tagging molecule. Yeah, it's not like you know, company can do it <laughs> at the moment. Any questions so far about fluorescence and its, you know, derivatives? I couldn't understand it. Can you explain? Okay. Yes. So, for example, if we have a circulated fluorescent protein, right, it will be sensitive to the environment. But if we directly measure the concentration using regular fluorescence microscope, then the local concentration of fluorescent protein would affect the signal and read out. It's really not necessary, the environment change. For example, you have a thicker cell region versus a thinner cell region, you will see different signals. So it's basically biased by the cell morphology instead of the biochemical environment. But FRIM can directly measure the lifetime of the fluorescent protein, so it will be independent of the concentration or thickness of cell. So it will provide relatively precise measurement or biochemical environment for these you know, sensitive frozen proteins. Is it clear to you? Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> it's good to give us some breaks. <laughs> So all these uh, frozen tools, you know, can be not only applied to the cells, but also to uh, animals. So particularly recently, they are so-called the infrared frozen protein available, so that it will allow you to have deep penetration of tissues. Now, previously, if we are using the relatively short wavelengths of frozen protein, such as cyan, yellow, green, their wavelengths are all below 600 nanometer. So all the light, if you excite on tissue, any frozen below 600 nanometer will be absorbed by tissue. So you cannot excite efficiently for the deep frozen embedded in the tissue. Okay, but with infrared frozen protein now, it will allow you to visualize deep tissue signals. Let's see. have to pray it will work <laughs> after breakdown. Now we switch it to a map here. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about that. <laughs> Actually, you know, most of my students are already using Mac, you know. I always ask them, what's the benefit? They say, oh, it look cool. And, uh, <laughs> but so that's, that's another, another advantage, right, I didn't expect. I'll speed up a little bit, so we should have enough time.
Maybe I should not be too, you know, rush the program. Okay, good. So as you can see from the cartoon, if you attach a targeting molecule to the fluorescent protein, and if you shine locally on the fluorescent protein, it will destroy the neighboring targeting molecule. Therefore, you specifically shut down the signaling molecule at this local region to look at how this local suppression of the signaling molecule would affect you know, the cellular functions. Okay, so if you have time, you can, you know, read this book by Mark Zimmer about the revolution of green frozen protein. As you can see, there are many, you know, transgenic uh, animals can be generated. And you can only see most of the signal are from superficial tissues, right? Because this short wavelength frozen protein, you know, the frozen will be absorbed mainly by tissue. Okay, if it's embedded deep. So now we already know we can conveniently using different color frozen protein to tag and monitor the dynamics and traffic of the different molecules. How we can measure or visualize molecular interactions. For example, in this case, two molecules interacting to each other. How can we visualize that? One technology is so-called flat frozen resonant energy transfer. So basically you can attach one molecule with one kind of color frozen protein, the other molecule with a different color frozen protein. And whenever they lock into a certain position, you will see a specific color and chemistry, and therefore you know, uh huh, something is going on, right? So that's the flat principle. I want to briefly go through that. On the left, we have a donor, so called flat donor. And on the right, usually it's longer wavelengths, it's called flat acceptor. When these two are far apart, excitation of donor will have emission from donor with cyan color, okay? When they are close to each other, excitation of the donor will have energy transfer to the acceptor so that you will see a longer wavelength emission out. So based on the emission observed, you can tell whether these two frozen proteins are close to each other or not. Okay? If they are close to each other, you see a yellow color or green color here. If they are far away from each other, you see a cyan color. Very simple principle, you can really detect whether two frozen proteins are close to each other or not. And based on this principle, you can design so-called molecular biosensors to detect intracellular molecular activities or biochemical signals. Uh, the idea is you can fuse, ECLP stands for enhanced cyan frozen protein, EYP stands for enhanced yellow frozen protein. And if you can connect these two together by a signaling molecule, ECLP serve as donor, EYP serve as acceptor. When these signal molecule change conformation upon stimulation, you will see a flat change, okay? So by monitoring flat, you can monitor the conformational change of this molecule. Or you can fuse two intacting domain together, and initially, these two intacting domain will not bind together. Therefore, the flat will be low. But when a stimulation comes, it will cause a binding between these two intacting domains, and therefore, you can see the flat. So basically, just monitor flat. You can tell whether domains are interacting to each other or a domain has conformational change. Okay? So this is the principle people utilize to develop different kind of molecular biosensors to visualize intracellular molecular activities. So here are list three examples. One is the calcium biosensor. People just stick, uh, connect CLP and YP serving as donor and acceptor together with cal modulin and M13. Whenever calcium comes in, it will have flat. And if calcium goes away, flat will be gone. Okay? So therefore, you can use this to monitor calcium concentration. Or people can use this same principle to monitor small GDPSs such as RAS and RAP1. So both are small GDPSs, but as you can see, RAS 
can be activated from the cell periphery and extend in, into the intracellular space. Whereas RAP, although belong to the same small GTPS family, but the excitation activation pattern is quite opposite. It starts at perinuclear region, extend to the cell periphery. Okay? So with flat bar sensor, you can really visualize the relative spatial temporal you know, difference between molecules. And another example is thousand kinase ABO, which is a crucial molecule for the cancer development. As you can see, using the thousand kinase ABO bar sensor based on flat, you can visualize the ABO kinase is specifically activated at the membrane microdomains, like membrane ruffles. You can see the high and hot zones are specifically localized at these membrane ruffle regions. It's not global everywhere. Okay? And my lab also utilized flat principle to develop molecular bar sensors to visualize signaling transduction intracellularly. So one example I want to introduce is detecting the activity of focal adenine kinase. So many of us probably are doing cellular studies, right? When the cells are cultured on the dish, they attach the surface, right? And focal adenine complex is a very important functional domain in the cell, mediating the surface and cell interactions. So basically they will attach to an extracellular matrix protein and integrating which receptor on the cell will mediate to formulate the focal complex. And in the focal complex there are you know, tons of molecules there. And focal adenine kinase is the most crit critical one. Actually it regulates the assembly and the disassembly of the focal adhesion complex. Okay? And as you can tell it's called focal adenine kinase which means it's an enzyme. Right? Uh, we can easily use flat bar sensor to detect its activity. So the idea is very simple. We first look at the functional domains of these focal kinase. It has mainly two or three domains, one called firm domain in the N-terminal, one called the kinase domain, which is really the catalytic enzymatic domain, and another one called focal adhesion targeting domain. So this domain allows the focal kinase to go focal complex. Okay? And the critical structure, people already know that in the rest state, the focal kinase will be folded. Okay? The kinase domain in the cyan color will be masked by the firm domain. When the signaling started or initiated, the kinase domain will start to have a light phosphorylation on the 397,000 side on this side. Upon this phosphorylation, it will recruit SARC through the SH2 domain and then cause the opening of the whole domain and therefore activation of FAC. So if you can measure or monitor the phosphorylation level of the 397 and monitor the activity of this full coating kinase. Okay? So that's how we design the bar sensor. We have a SH2 domain from SARC and a substrate sequence connected by a linker. Okay? And this will further connected by donor on the left and accept on the right. So the idea is when this substrate, 1397, got phosphorylated by focal kinase, it will cause bonding between the SH2 domain to cause flat change. Okay? This is the cartoon to show the activation mechanism. Before the phosphorylation happens or before the focal kinase activation, CAP, YP, they have sort of like weak anti-parallel dimer tendency. So they will stick together relatively with high flat. But when these 397,000 sites is phosphorylated, it will start to bind to the bottom pocket. Okay? This phosphorylation will bind to the bottom pocket and separate the donor acceptor. Therefore, it will cause a flat chain or flat reduction. Okay? So we have engineered this power sensor and purified the protein and measured spectrum, as you can see, the 480 region is the emission from the donor. The 530 region is the emission from the acceptor. So the black line represents the spectrum of the bar sensor before stimulation. After we add focal kinase, it will phosphorate to the bar sensor and cause the reduction of the acceptor emission. Okay? The red line represents the activated bar sensor. An increase of the donor emission. So what did you know, uh, happen here? Basically, the emission from the acceptor goes down, the emission from the donor goes up, right? Suggesting 
the energy transfer has been reduced, so therefore most energy will be transferred back to the donor. That's why you see more emission from donor, less emission from acceptor. Is that clear to you? Okay. So this is as we expected or designed, right? Then we further measure whether this power sensor is specific in detecting the focaline kinase activity. As you can see here, we introduce the focaline kinase and the SARC together with the power sensor. Only focaline kinase can cause a flat change. SARC cannot, which is very good news for us because SARC and focaline kinase usually go to the same substellar locations. If the power sensor can measure both kinases, that's no good because we don't know where the phosphorylation occur or where the phosphorylation based on what kind of kinase activation, right? So if the bar sensor can only be phosphorylated and activated by focaline kinase, that's a good news for us. Okay, we have high specificity. And Western blog pretty much confirmed this. Then we further introduce the focaline kinase bar sensor into living cells. It's already known adhesion will cause focaline kinase activation. Okay. When we introduce the bar sensor into the cell, we can also measure and see a flat change upon adhesion, suggesting all bar sensors can measure the focal kinase activity. Okay. Then we further test whether we are specifically detecting the focal kinase activity. The way we confirm that is introduce the focal kinase bar sensor into focal kinase knockout cells. As you can see, if we knock out the focal kinase and introduce the bar sensor into the cells with empty vector or SARC, there's no flat response. But if we co-introduce uh, active focaline kinase or Y-type focaline kinase, you can see the flat change. Negative fact or kinase dead fact cannot flat change. All these suggest the focaline kinase bar sensor we develop can specifically report focal adhesion kinase activity only, not others, right? Only focal in kinase activity can restore the FRAT response. Okay? And then, if we introduce active FAC together with the bar sensor into the cell, if we knock down the thousand site, thousand mutate to phenylalanine, or if we knock down the SH2 domain, even active FAC cannot induce FRAT change anymore, suggesting truly the FRAT response is due to the interaction between these two elements, right? If we eliminate any of these elements, FRAT will no longer be there. Is it clear to you? Okay. So these all confirm all design uh, as expected to the results. Okay. And Western blog pretty much confirmed all these FRAT observations. Then we want to ask one biological question. Because people are debating where or whether the focaline kinase is activated specifically at some submembrane macro domains called the lipid rafts. Okay. So lipid rafts has a lot of fatty acid, saturated fatty acid chains and the cholesterol and the signaling molecules. So whether FAC is specifically activated these subcellular submembrane domains. This submembrane domain has size below 50 nanometers. So if you're using traditional microscope, you cannot visualize it because the resolution of a traditional microscope is about 200 nanometers. Right? So you cannot see lipid rafts or macro domains in this case. But we can engineer the flat bar sensor to specifically force the bar sensor to stay inside lipid rafts. As you can see here, we can add a peptide containing glycine cysteine, and there will be fatty acid, saturated fatty acid chain modified, insert into lipid rafts. Or we can modify the bar sensor so that it will be forced to stay outside the lipid rafts. And we can compare which bar sensor can report the fat activity. Okay? to know whether focal kinase is specifically activated at certain macro domains. Okay? As you can see, these two cells, left is measuring the FAC activity inside the lipid rafts. On the right is measuring the FAC activity outside the rafts. You can already see, during adhesion, FAC activity can be turned on in the lipid rafts, but outside the rafts, there's nothing. Suggesting during adhesion assay, FAC activity can be only activated inside the rafts, okay? So what about growth factor stimulation? On the left, again, is the bar sensor measuring FAC activity outside of lipid rafts. On the right, we are specifically measuring the focal kinase activity inside the lipid rafts. As you can see, 
Hopefully the movie will work. Okay, it works. So as you can see, PDGF stimulation can only stimulate the focusing kinase activity inside the rafts, right? Is it clear? On the left, there's not much of a change. On the right, growth factor only specifically stimulate focusing kinase activity there. We further confirm this signal or readout is specifically occurring in the lipid rafts by destroying the lipid rafts. As you can see, growth factor can stimulate activity inside rafts if you use a methyl beta cyclodextrin, which destroys the lipid rafts, the fat will be gone, suggesting the microdomain integrity is very important for the focusing kinase activation. We further use an inhibitor, specifically inhibiting focal adenine kinase. As you can see, we can stimulate focal adenine kinase activity in the lipid rafts. And then if we drop the inhibitor for focal adenine kinase, you can see it turn into blue, right? Clearly suggesting all the signal we observe is specifically due to the focal adenine kinase activities, not non-specific signals, okay? So with all this, we have the conclusion. For the focal adenine kinase, although people know it will go to focal adenine complex, but there's always a debate whether focusing complex belong to the lipid raft domain. And our results clearly demonstrate that focal adhesion complex and lipid rafts have overlaps, okay? Because all the signal or the focusing kinase activity mainly occur at the lipid raft domain. If you put biosensor outside of the lipid rafts, you don't detect any fact activity, okay? So this is our focusing kinase biosensor uh, detection. We can also utilize biosensor to detect mechanical transaction as Roger also introduced a little bit. So here I want to briefly introduce our biosensor you know, detecting SAR kinase activity. So the principle is quite the same. We use two frozen protein at the two ends and acid domain which is bonding partner for a substrate upon phosphorylation. So this substrate is specifically designed to be phosphorylated by SARC kinase, but not other kinases, okay? So the principle is similar. In the beginning, the biosensor will have quite high flat because the anti-parallel affinity between the CFP and YP is dominating, so they have very close distance, have flat. But when the SARC is activated, oops, it's gone, okay. When the SARC is activated, it will phosphorylate this peptide and phosphorylated peptide will start to bind to the bottom pocket of the SS2 domain. Oh, this movie does not work. Oh, it works. As you can see, then the CLP YP will be separate from each other, and therefore the flat will be reduced. Okay? Same, same, similar kind of design as the focusing kinase bar sensor. So we introduce the SARC kinase biosensor into the cell first. As you can see, there are two killer cells. Blue color represent low activity, red color represent high activity. You can see you can easily challenge the cell with EGF, which is a known activator of the SARC kinase. This is my favorite movie. I always play at least twice. You can see it will turn on, and we can wash away stimulator, and it will cool down, okay? Suggesting truly we can monitor the dynamic activation of SARC in living cells and we can further improve its sensitivity by changing the flat pairs. So in this case, we use a white pad as the uh, flat acceptor, as you can see on the left. With the same stimulation, we can see more color change, suggesting higher sensitivity of the biosensor. Oh, did it go through? Is it clear to you? The color change is more obvious on the left compared to the right, right? And these same phenomena can be observed for the calcium bar sensor. Using white pad based bar sensor, you can see the calcium oscillation in the living cells more obviously compared to the original ECLP-YP pair, okay? So with this improved bar sensor, we can further target the bar sensor to the membrane such as you know, we can modify the end terminal of the bar sensor so that it will only stay on the membrane because SARC is known to be activated at the membrane, okay? So with membrane targeting, you can clearly see the bar sensor no longer diffuse in the whole cell, only stay in the membrane, 
and you can stimulate it. And if you add the specific inhibitor, for example, PP1, you can suppress the threat signals. Suggesting about sensor after targeting is still specific in reporting the SARC activity. Now, how can we utilize this molecular bio sensor to help us understand the mechanical transaction? So one idea we have is we can utilize so-called laser tracer. So the idea is we can grab a small bead with laser tracer and approach a cell. If the cell is expressing the molecular bio sensor and we can allow the bees to attach to the cell surface, then yank the bees. We probably can see whether the molecular bio sensor will have changed, right? And see how the cell perceives this mechanical stimulation. Okay. We first did the control experiment. We have a bio sensor introduced to the, into the cell and put the bees on top. But these bees are not coupled, mechanical coupled to the cell. We first test, we can use laser tracer to mechanically perturb the bees, right? Did you see the pink circle? That's the beads we can mechanically perturb. But we didn't see any you know, biochemical response in the cell because the beads and cell at this point is decoupled. Okay? Now, if we can code the beads with fibronectin, and then we can allow them to engage with integrin receptors and couple to the subtle skeleton. And if the biosensor is expressed in the cell, we can still using laser tracer to mechanically yank the bees and see how the cell responds. We first did the electron microscope image to show that if we deposit fibrinacin coated beads, the cell can truly form adhesion and grab the bees tightly. So these beads and cell body are mechanically coupled. Okay? Then if we apply laser tracer to the bead, and monitor threat response, so the sarcanase, you can clearly see Oops. There's a wave propagating from the pulling side. As you can see, this is the bees position. And there's a local activation already. And this local ad activation will trigger a global wave propagation of the sock toward the opposite direction of pulling you know, force. Okay? If we destroy the subtle skeleton components, such as subtle kinds D, which will disrupt acting filaments, then if you pull the bees again, you can, oh. Oops. you can still see the local activation around bees, but there's no more global activation. Okay? Same phenomenon can be observed if you can destroy the microtubule. You can still see certain level of local activation around bees. Around the bees, you can see, still see activation, but global activation is gone clearly suggesting that when we apply mechanical force, the local suck can be activated no, no matter what. Without mechanical support or the subtle skeleton or not, it will be activated. And then if the intact subtle skeleton component are there, it will allow the suck to induce the synthesis of new acting filaments. And these newly synthesized acting filaments will recruit suck kinase to the tip which will induce second round of synthesis, polymerization, and the recruitment of SARC. That's why we can observe this wave propagation of SARC activation on the membrane. Okay. So this is how we can utilize fat bar sensor to visualize mechanical transduction. We can, of course, also do the mechanical transduction related to the development of biology. So it's already known, as you heard from Lenz and uh, Todd, mechanical environment will affect stem cell functions. But how or what kind of molecular mechanism be, is behind this mechanical transduction is not that clear. So we utilize our sensor to visualize and try to answer these questions. The one first thing we have is we introduce into human mesenchymal stem cells with calcium bar sensor. And when we culture these stem cells on the solid or hard surface, as you can see, there's a spontaneous oscillation of calcium measured by calcium bar sensor. Okay, and you can pay attention, the triggering point is always occurring at the up right side, okay, always trigger at this side, and then propagate to the whole cell. You don't need to stimulate this cell, it's automatically, spontaneously ongoing, okay. You can quantify all this, and interestingly, if you culture this cell on different mechanical environment, for example, in this case, 
On the up left corner is a culture on relatively hard surface gels, 8.5 kPa. On the upper right side, we culture cell on 5 kPa. And on the lower uh, left corner, we culture cell on very soft gel, 1 kPa. And you probably want to pay attention what happened. We still monitor the spontaneous, you know, calcium signaling. What's the ob obvious observation? What's the difference between these three group of cells? Can you tell? Very good. Frequency, right? And also the magnitude has been changed. So this is quantification. I don't know why the movie just disappeared. So basically, if you look at the different stiffness of the gels, if you catch on very hard you know, glass bottom, then you can see spontaneous calcium oscillation nicely. If you catch a relatively medium you know, stiffness, it will be reduced. If you catch on a very soft gel, the calcium oscillation is almost gone. Okay? Suggesting possibly this extracellular mechanical environment would affect intracellular tension and therefore mod modulate the calcium channel on the cell membrane and affect the calcium oscillation. Okay? So we further measure the intracellular tension using a row flat bar sensor, which is a marker for intracellular tension. Indeed, as you can see, when we culture cells on different stiffness gel, the intracellular tension can be modulated. So I don't have time to present other evidence to show that we have demonstrated uh, if there's a cell culture on soft surface, the membrane will be relatively relaxed. Therefore, channels will be relatively closed. So therefore, the calcium leakage will not be as much as if you culture cell on a hard surface, which cell will be stretched, calcium will be more leaky on the channels. That's why on the hard surface, you see more oscillation than the softer surface. Okay. I want to utilize the rest of my minutes to cover what we have on other applications. One is we can also utilize the bar sensor to understand how micro environment would affect the cellular functions or molecular activities. One way we can do it is we can create micro patterns on the surface. As you can see, the red strip represent fibronectin coatus uh, area, whereas the black surface represent inertial area, cell cannot adhere. And you can see the cell will be nicely aligned along these strips. So it's like we force the cell to you know, only migrate along this line, just like forcing them to do martial arts, and we want to understand how this micro environment would affect molecular activity and cellular functions. And this is a one bar sensor we develop to measure the rack sumo GTPS activity. Actually, it's a, we modified based on you know uh, Matsuda's group. As you can see, when the cells are forced to migrate along these strips, PDGF can induce a very nice polarized distribution of rack activity. Right, high on the leading edge and low on the tail. Okay. And if you inhibit the SARC kinase in these uh, migrating cells, as you can see, so at first you can see nice polarized distribution of RAC, but if we add PP1, which inhibits SARC, RAC activity and the polarity will be inhibited. Okay? And together with other data and the literature, RAC and SARC are forming a couple. If you inhibit any one of them, you will knock down the other. So they are coupled globally. So if you imagine, if we measure the SARC activity in these strips, you would imagine because they are coupled, we would expect to see a polarized SARC activity as well, right? Because RAC is polarized, and RAC and SARC are coupled together, right? But if you look at the SARC activity, very surprisingly, we see a global activation. There's no polarized distribution at all. Clearly suggesting if you are using biochemical assay, you know, lysis, the millions of cells, and mix them all together. You know, you can see the coupling between two molecules in the same signaling pathway. But if you look at on the subcellular context, the activation mechanism could be quite different, depending on the local environment and local you know mediators or molecules. So I think I already present enough evidence to show you that we can truly measure many molecules or many molecular activities in the living cells at a single cell level. But you probably would ask. Is it possible for us to simultaneously visualize multiple molecular signals in the same cell? 
Okay. So I want to introduce a new flat pair. We recently demonstrated that it will allow us to simultaneously visualize two signals at least in the same cell. So this is based on uh, orange and cherry frozen proteins. So orange is relatively you know, close to the red, but not to the red zone yet. But cherry is relatively deep red. So their color could be quite different from the typical CLP, YP based flat bar sensor. Okay? So as you can see, this is a CLP YP based flat bar sensor with relatively yellow color. And if you use the orange and cherry, and we can see you know, quite different color. And that's the spectrum of them. So if you can imagine, if we can install optical filter in the microscope, you can easily separate the fluorescence emissions from two different bar sensors and simultaneously visualize signals in the same cell. So this is what I want, want to demonstrate. On the left, we are visualizing SARC activity based on CLP-YP. And on the right, we are visualizing the membrane bond matrix metoproteinase. Okay? As you can see, this is the same cell and we monitor them simultaneously. And when we stimulate cells, you can clearly see the SARC activity is very global and fast and transient. Whereas MT1MP activity is relatively slow and mainly concentrated at the cell periphery. Okay? Suggesting this combined color of frozen bar sensors can allow you to visualize the special temporal you know, interaction between different molecules. Is that in real time here? This is uh, every one minute. Total is about like 25 minutes. Okay. We can push to you know close to real time, you know, but so photo breaching, you know, all these issues will come up then. Oh okay, so we have uh, the summary. I hope I already present enough evidence to you that the molecular engineering and frozen bar sensor can truly help us to develop powerful tools for live cell imaging to address important biological questions. And these molecular hierarchy or activities inside living cells are largely dependent on subcellular locations, which is quite you know, intuitive to us because we imagine these molecules just like human beings, right? When we are sitting in the classroom, we always behave very quietly and, you know, gentleman or lady, whatever. But if we are going to the karaoke bar or maybe to the barbecue, we may, you know, create different activities or noise, right? So molecules are doing similar things. When you throw this molecule into different subcellular environment, their function could be quite different because the local environment, the local intermediators are quite different. So their function can be very different. Actually, we also have another study I didn't have time to present. We show that one phosphatase molecule, they can be nicely tuned by local intermediators to affect its function. Okay? And these tools can also allow us to investigate the special temporal activation patterns of signaling molecules, living cells, under other the microenvironment effect or mechanical stimulation so that we can really have the molecular insights how the microenvironment or mechanical stimulation can affect intracellular biochemical signals or molecular activities and therefore affect cellular functions or cell fate. Obviously all this will not be possible, particularly like Ji Hei Sung who just graduated. She did most of the submembrane targeting, submembrane visualization of molecular activities. And Ta Jin Kim did the stem cell visualization of molecular activities on the different mechanical environment. And we also have post opposition available if any of you are interested. I want to thank our collaborators from different institutes. And we are very grateful to all the funding and support, particularly EBIX STC from NSF, which really stimulated us to you know, explore some very bold direction in terms of utilizing the bar sensors. I'll be very happy to answer questions. Very good question. So right now, you know, in principle, it's doable, you know, because the new version, right now, the quantum yield and the extinction efficient is not as, you know, desirable yet. 
but at least you can achieve a couple hundred micron deep depth, that's no problem. Of course, the new version of this infrared frozen protein will come up, I'm sure, which will eventually allow you to go even deeper. But how can you go now in living tissue with, with that long wavelength? Right now? Yeah. I think only a couple, you know, hundred microns. Because of the property of frozen, so this new version of the infrared protein is not as desired yet. So it's still only a couple hundred microns? Yes, <laughs> right. But that's not because of the, you know, the infrared wavelengths, because the frozen like folding efficiency, all this. This can be improved if we make further mutations. In the focal adhesion experiments, um, I noticed that this, the scale for the readout was like 0.25 to 0.5. Is that like a measure of fret efficiency and is that a common range? Very good question. So most of fret uh, bar sensor, if you read the literature, you know, the dynamic range is a major, major difficulty. So most of them are like 20, 30%, you know, that's pretty good already. Uh, rarely you will see like 50% or beyond the change in terms of bar sensor. So this 0.2 to 0.5 is quite good already. Yeah, we recently have one called SHIP-2 bar sensor, which can give us like more than 100% change. But that's really depend on luck. You know, usually you don't get that. You said there's a limit on the shortening the uh, time scale? Uh, yes. So, yeah, so the limitation is frozen protein usually is not as good as comparing to the quantum dots or frozen dyes. So their uh, quantum mute are relatively low. So if you want to see uh, enough of signal, you need to shine, you know, pretty much a lot of the excitation light, which will cause for the breaching all these issues. So if you want to have enough of signal, we usually have to expose or exposure of the image have to be relatively long to crack in a photon. Okay, so it's uh, usually like uh, one second or something. We can push shorter, but then the signal will be much less. Or then you have to you know, increase excitation light, which will cause the detrimental you know, photo bleaching effect. So it's always a balance. That's why we cannot push the time resolution too much at, the point, at this point. But there are new versions of the frozen protein, you know, continuously coming up, people may continue, you know, direct erosion or modification so that they become more photostable, all these. This will be improved. But at the current stage, most of the available frozen protein, you can just only reach around that range. So are red probes um, membrane permeable, um, such as they can be used as uh, detecting paracrine signaling? From uh, one cell to the other cell? Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, I think probably I didn't you know, clearly uh, describe well. So this frozen protein, we basically introduce gene into the cell. So the cell will utilize the gene to produce a protein inside the cell. Yeah, but TFP is a big protein, right? Right. Mammalian cells doesn't produce that big. Uh, actually, they are okay, you know, at, at least to, you know, the cells which we are working on, you know, they produce pretty good the level of frozen protein, you can see that. Yeah, that's not a problem, I think. Yes. Okay. Two sets of biosensors, do you have uh, any, uh, like, the excitation, the emission spectra affect the other biosensor, and does that confound your results at all? How do you deal with that? That, that's a very good question. Yeah, so, you know, we of course uh, create the pairs specifically so that they will be have far, you know, distance between each other so that the cross excitation, cross emission will be minimized. But still we have to do a control experiment to confirm that the bleed through between different channels is not enough to, you know, cause too much noise. Yeah. Lance? Yeah, do you have any rule of thumb about how much uh, you should express one of these uh, biosensors relative to the endogenous levels? Because some of them, they contain the binding site that could be uh, uh, dominant negative. 
Very good question. Yes, so this is always a question, you know, but usually what we do before we uh, really study the biological question, we all do some, always do some control experiment. We vary the concentration or the expression, and we pick relatively a medium range of these proteins, and we measure the downstream signalings. For example, for the SARC biosensor, or FACT biosensor, we measure, you know, some known downstream molecules such as ERK. You know, the level of the expression within this range will not affect ERK, then we think, oh, that's pretty safe. But I agree, you know, if you express too much, definitely. Actually, we can see, if you see a very bright cell, sometimes you see very weird behavior, you know. So usually we always choose, you know, in the middle range. Very good question. Project. Most of you done with, with transient trans transfections, and do you ever stably transfect the cells with the fluorescent probes? We have not. We did the once experiment, you know, we using the selection, try to create a stable cell line, but somehow the fluorescence intensity we ob obtain is quite weak, so it's a very difficult, you know, to use this st stable cell line. So right now we just rely on transient, effect, transient transfection so that we can obtain enough for the intensity and the reasonable, you know, signal transduction. Yeah. Also, I was wondering, you know, with, I mentioned before the, the experiment that you did with the bead attached and the force applied, mm -hmm. and you had this wave of, of SARC activation. Right. Have you seen that in, in, in any other probes, that kind of a transient uh, wave-like uh, transmission of activation? Uh, no, I don't think so. Actually, even for this wave, trans, uh, wave propagation, we can only observe in the HUVAC cell, you know, using SARC bar sensor. If you look at, you know, SARC activity in fibroblasts or small smart cells, you don't see that, that. So we think this HUVAC cell, you know, the membrane structure or subtle screen interaction is quite dynamic. That's why it allows us to see this kind of, you know, wave propagation. And that was just with the membrane bound start. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Does that have something to do with it, do you think? Or? I, th I think so. If the biosensor is diffusible in the whole body, probably you wouldn't be able to see that because the signal can be easily, you know, uh, averaged out by these diffusible biosensors. Mm -hmm. Only you force them to stay on the membrane, you can see that. What was the time scale of the experiment? It, uh, most of them are just 25, 20, yeah, or 30 okay. minutes. And each uh, image interval is, in general, one minute. I have one question though, <laughs> for you guys. So, can you imagine there are a lot of like dyes, right? Which can measure, for example, calcium. They have fewer to all these can measure the calcium concentration or oscillation, right? Why we are using flat genetically encoded bar sensor to do this? Anybody has thought about that? Why not using dyes? Because most of the time, dye actually provide better you know, quantum yield or fluorescence intensity. Fluorescent protein usually is weaker or dimmer. But how can you make sure the calcium changes due to one signal or the other signal? Like specific, due to a specific signal? That's the one reason. Also the dyes be toxic over time? Uh, for these uh, fluorescent <coughs> dyes? Yeah. Some of them are toxic, but some of them are okay, actually. Okay. Yeah. So the key issue is why we are working on this. Probably you can you know, take it uh, you know, back and uh, appreciate that. Because this genetic enco encoded bar sensor, we can make modifications easily so that we can specifically force them to stay into any subcellular regions. Okay? Whereas if you are using chemical dyes, they diffuse everywhere. It's very hard for you to control them. Okay? So sometimes it will be difficult for you to measure subcellular organelle activities. Whereas genetic encoded bar sensor can easily, you know, do that. Okay. How do you do? How do you localize it? I mean, do you do? Do you use a particular protein that, that you know localizes to a particular region in the cell, or? Yeah, these are well studied. You know, there are a lot of signaling peptide, so you easily just fuse the gene encoding the peptide together with our bar sensor. Yes, so you can force them to stay in the ER, stay in the nucleus, or any other subcellular organelles. You can measure that. A chemical dye typically you cannot have the control. They diffuse everywhere. Any other questions? Um, if I have a 
technical question. I think you show a slide that the, the cells in different uh, stiffness substrate, they will have different uh, calcium saturation, and the, uh, the calcium saturation always start from one end. Mm -hmm. uh, that means it can sense or what is triggered from that, that end, and is there any, any holes in very good question. So that's uh, actually another paper I didn't have time to uh, you know, present. So we noticed when the cells are cultured on the, uh, the mechanical environment, the stress distribution obviously is not homogeneous. There are some you know, region which has relatively high stress, which this region will cause more leakage of the channels, or calcium channels. That's why calcium leakage mainly occurs in this region, and the local ER will release the calcium to cause the calcium oscillation, therefore propagate to the whole body. So if we can locally manipulate the mechanical tension on these subcellular regions, we can change where the calcium initiation starts. I was thinking from the other way. That means that you can see from the picture also where is the higher strain or stress is located. I mean, you can add it Yes, very good, very good. So we have done also traction uh, force microscope, basically embed bees into the gel and culture cell on top, and we can correlate the calcium initiation site with the high traction force measurement, suggesting truly there's a tension which causing the channel to be more leakage, to be more leaky, so that it will allow the triggering of the calcium oscillation in these specific subcellular locations. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, that's great. Thank you, Roger.